Middleman versus value added. That's the discussion today with two of my besties in the business of agriculture, Ryan Moe of StoneX and Todd Thurman of his own, his own enterprise and LinkedIn fame. Hey, Damian Mason here with a question before we hop into this episode of the Business of Agriculture. If you farm for a living, you employ a lot of amazing technology from your inputs that you put into the soil to the tractor that you sit in, your combine, the amazing data that it harvests. But has your soil analytics kept up technologically with everything else in your farming operation? I would venture to say that no, it is not. Sure, you check for your nitrogen, your phosphorus, your potassium, your micronutrients as well. But what about disease pressure? Do you know what diseases and what pests you're going to face next year? No, you don't. But you can now figure that out with Pattern Ag's predictive analytics. Think about it. They can tell you now with testing what the likelihood of facing nasty diseases, things like cyst nematode or uh, sudden death syndrome, what the likelihood of you having this in your field, then you know how to prepare, how to treat, and where to invest your money. It's using technology to make you bigger yields and therefore make you bigger money. Go to www.pattern.ag to learn more. They are pioneering the way in predictive agronomy. Hey there, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. I've got guests, friends of show, Ryan Moe and Todd Thurman on here. This topic we're covering here today is going to probably piss some people off because we're going to go against the grain that so many times we hear, especially in a producer, among producers in agriculture, about cutting out the middleman and about whether that's even possible, about cutting out the middleman because they're taking a bunch of profits should be ours. But is that true? About the actual value-added process, you know, it's very common to talk about how the farmer's share is only about 14% of all the food dollars spent. But why are those other $86, 86 cents, I'm sorry, per dollar out there? If it's not really delivering any value, then why is it so difficult to capture? That's the big topic here today, middleman versus value-added. All right, Todd, tell us how... Tell, the inspiration for this was a comment you made on someone else's LinkedIn post. I want you to give me that background because that's how this whole thing came about. And then uh, Ryan has some pretty good uh, thoughts on this. Go. So the discussion was about how much the packer gets of that. I don't know if it, they actually use the term food dollar in that discussion, but that was essentially the the point is that the, the packer was taking out an unfair portion of that uh, revenue that uh, that could have otherwise presumably gone to the farmer, the, to the producer. And uh, they used the, the term middleman in that description. And I replied that I didn't really think that was a proper use of the term middleman, that we could certainly argue about whether or not the packer takes a unfair portion of that revenue for themselves. Uh, but I, I don't think it's reasonable to call them a middleman be, middleman because they're actually adding a significant amount of value. And so it led to a discussion around the type of middlemen that that may grease the process, but they don't really add value to the product versus middlemen. Uh, and again, I think that's a misuse of the term that that are actually you know essential parts of the supply chain that actually add, add value to the product. And that was the 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 thing I thought was important to distinguish there. I I, I think that is exceedingly important because middleman connotes carries the connotation that it's just somebody that's raking money along the way. Are there examples of this? Yes, there are. Do people in ag think? Because Todd, you've been very very um, smart about this. You said there's so many people in ag that think that. Everything that happens in our industry is so unique only to our industry that somehow no other business has folks in the middle making money. Well, that's ludicrous. I sold $28,000 worth of timber off of my property 15, 16 years ago. And I can tell you that the $400 I got for a log obviously was a small part of the money until it became a, a coffee table, right? Well, it's the same thing. Well, am I getting screwed because my log, well, you only gave me $400 and here you went and turned it into $150,000 worth of coffee tables. Well, it's the value added. So again, there's this happens everywhere. There's a lot of process in there. Um, Ryan, you brought up an important thing because before we even talk about middleman versus value added, you brought up something about the definition of value. Um, so we wanna, yeah, Walmart with the green. 
on what value is, right? Uh, because everybody, I think a lot of people have a different definition of value. And if the three of us can agree on what value actually means to us, then we can actually have a constructive conversation around it. Um, my belief is that value, it's an equation. It is if what you get is greater than what you pay for, there is value there. Walmart ruined the word value because most people hear value and they think cheap, right? And then they think value add, and then they, they just, everything always goes back to cheap as soon as the V word gets mentioned. So I think it's important that we agree that value is something that what you get is more than what you pay for. So can the both of you just agree with me on that one and we can move on? I agree with you on that. And I I'm agree super. whether or not Walmart did it or not. But yeah, most people think they're getting a value. That means they think they're saving. Whereas, yes, adding value is a different concept. Again, the log doesn't drag a $400 log to somebody's house and say, I got your coffee table. And they're like, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? Well, right. It becomes a, a $400 log becomes uh, five, do, uh, you know, a, a, a dozen coffee tables after the value added process, right. it takes something and turns it into something of more value. It's, well, it's and, a, go ahead, Todd. No, I, I, I definitely agree with that. I think the, the the challenge there is what people perceive as value. So what do they feel like they paid for um, and what did they feel like they got? Um, some of that is is difficult to put a uh, um, it's difficult to attach a metric to that because um, a lot of times what we talk about in terms of adding value to commoditized products is for example in the way that we might raise an animal or the ways we might raise crops and that might be a perceived value that might vary from consumer to consumer so some consumers might attach more value to that than others and yeah and so uh, exactly as what they attach value to right so what it is that gets them to that feeling of i got more than what i paid for or i i got what i wanted for what i paid for as opposed to having to accept or be a market taker on something and that's what we find ourselves in the commodities business oftentimes is we are market takers because we are in the position of we have to take what the market gives us for the price at which we sell the product that we produce, right? Well, that's that's the by the way that's the foundation of this very thing is that the the whole we we covered it in our business of ag success group was that oh these poor farmers are far are, are price takers. I'm like, well, first off, I, I'm not anti farm or anything, but let's just talk about where the value is derived. If you wouldn't mind, uh, if you wouldn't create a bunch of uh, tar, and then expect it to get the asphalt shingle that I buy at Home Depot is worth more than the tar. It's worth more than the tar and the rocks and even the paper that the shingle bundle is wrapped in because of all the things that are added to it along the way. And a lot of times in ag, we forget that. You know, they invite you to the farmer's share breakfast every March and, and play the whole little thing about, oh, you're only gonna pay, you're only gonna pay 37 cents for breakfast because that's all the farmer gets out of an average breakfast. I'm like, that's because there's a lot of other things that happen in between, and at the Todd's point, that value is what a consumer is willing to you're talking about Ryan. What a consumer attaches a value to is go and give the go and give the consumer a damn hog, and they're going to say what? I'm like, well, here's a hog. No, it's valuable because it's been cut, processed into bacon, smoked, packaged, transported to their local Kroger, and then made so all they have to do is go home and cook it. And that's where I think the the disconnect is. And it also. Um... I think people have a perception that it's easier to step up in the value chain than what it actually is. Like I'm going through, I've got three very micro examples right now that are impacting my life. Um, you know, entered into the meat business with my friend where we are. Um, he's raising cattle for me out in Western Minnesota and I'm bringing it in here to the suburbs and selling it to hockey moms. Um, sounds like a pretty simple thing to start, but when you start dealing with a high-end consumer that has very high demands for what they want, uh, all of a sudden dealing with these people is a giant pain in the ass. Mm. And the farmer's like, well, I don't want to do that. Well, then, okay, then don't act like what that person in the middle is doing isn't valuable because you need that person to get that um, 
you need that person to get that product to the end consumer. And so if you want to sell to that hockey mom in the suburbs, then go ahead and produce the product that they want exactly how they want it and deliver it to them exactly when and where they want it. Um, that's a small example, but it's just, I was experiencing that as I, as I'm sorting through packages of hamburger at 1130 at night, I'm like, this is a pain in the ass mm -hmm. and it's not worth it. It's well, not. <laughs> well, it might be worth it. And by the way, that's the, that is a, that's a great example of, of defining, and Todd, I want you to go with this. That's defining what the value is. The value was place. First off, it, you got the product to the customer where they wanted it. Every, you know, every ag person we know will go through some, well, hell, look what they're doing. They're selling that steak for, you know, $4 more a pound than I'd sell. Well, maybe it's because they're in a, it's the old thing like um, Todd and I uh, and Ryan, we've all been at a hotel, dear listener. And let's say you don't want to go anywhere. You're tired from traveling and you want a beer and it's 1230 at night and you're sitting there in your underpants. And there's a beer a block down the street at 7-Eleven. If you want to put on your clothes, go walk down there and maybe get mugged. There's a beer in your hotel refrigerator. And it's going to cost you $5 to take that Budweiser out of there. And there's beer. To, which one do you? It's the same thing. Sometimes value is place. Place where the customer wants it. That's what you're talking about, right? And then it becomes a matter of all the other things. Yeah. I mean, it's... It's amazing what the customer actually wants. And then when we've developed the food system in and the grocery system into being what it is in America, in this day and age, the variety, I mean, that the US consumer is accustomed to, it's really hard to, it's really hard to, it's really hard to match that. When we start looking at this direct to consumer model, which is, uh, you know, really become really popular on the meat side, and, you know, one of the things that people learn pretty quickly is that we've specialized all of those steps in the process. And in the meantime, everyone's gotten really good at those processes. And so when you take those, quote unquote, middlemen out, you have to do all those things. And so not only is it somebody has to do the work, but they're almost certainly going to be much better at it than you are. And they're definitely going to be much more efficient at it than you are. And so if I think about, I always sort of tell people I have two feet and or one foot in each world, you know, my, my real job is working in, in commercial swine production, uh, which is, you know, highly integrated, uh, highly consolidated. And then I do a little bit of locker beef on the side in our little small uh, farm here at home. And, I can tell you that I have no delusions of grandeur when it turns to competing with the uh, the big commercial meat producers on the beef side. You know, I'm just uh, I'm never going to be as efficient as they are or as good at it as they are. By the way, I want to point so out. I think Todd, Ryan, Ryan, Ryan and I are both watching this. If you're if if you're listening no, to the audio, yeah, if you're listening <laughs> to the audio and you're not watching the video, the one thing that Todd is brilliant as he is as a livestock consultant, he needs to get some uh, insect control uh, consultation. He's got flies buzzing on his head. He's getting swarmed with flies like a pile of cow dung. I mean, this is something. it's one, it's one fly. Yeah. yeah. God. What the problem <laughs> is is we haven't had a cold enough weather here, which I'm sure Ryan is not. Uh, not sharing my uh, concern there. We haven't had cold enough weather to get rid of it. It's, oh no! It's look, January. Look, 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 look behind me. We just had uh, <laughs> we just had two and a half inches of rain up here, and it all soaked in because we haven't froze yet. So answer me this, um, and Ryan. Okay, I, I want to God down. kill the fly. It's it's annoying me too. <laughs> uh, I want to go down this road about the value add and what your your meat example and that's where this thing obviously came up the the meat example is the one that he actually had a address i think i got it middleman versus there's an assumption that there's not work and it's kind of like that thing that and it's not just ag people a lot of folks have this disconnect my mom was this way you know that whole thing of well i went to the doctor and the doctor only spent 11 minutes with me and then charged me this i'm like well did you get the problem handled did you get the problem handled? And so there's this thing that somehow if a per, if, a, if an entity only touches this pig, you you had the pig on your farm for five and a half months, and it was only at the Tyson facility for uh, 23 hours, somehow that there's no value added. Well, that 
billion dollar facility in Coldwater, Michigan, where they're processing or Delphi, Indiana, where the hell it is. There's a billion dollar facility. There's the employees. There's the inherent risk. There's the liability. There's the the financial outlay. There's also the market making, and there's also the distribution to pretend that somehow because the pig was only there for you know eleven hours, somehow there was no value added because it was on your farm for five and a half months is ludicrous. Because when you start running the numbers, the returns are paltry generally on a lot of the middlemen stuff. What we call middlemen, the returns are usually pretty lousy. Yeah, and. I'll just say this and then I'll step off my free market capitalism soapbox. If the free market is allowed to succeed, if that person in the middle is not is extracting extra profit or excessive profit and not adding the value to the end product, that is a market that is wide open for somebody to step into and take over if the free market is allowed to operate. And this so there is where yeah, yeah. And the point is if 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 I'm the only if I'm out here and I'm making so much money by just letting a pig walk through my building and it took you you're making nothing at the farm level and I'm making all the money by letting a pig walk through my building, wouldn't two other smart guys like you build another building and let the hogs walk through there and and start right. si- start siphoning off my profit margins. Now there is right. the argument about about market size and and oligopolistic practices and that's particularly been addressed with the meat packing thing and Todd I want to get you to go down that road and then we'll talk about meat since that's where this whole thing the genesis of it. Before we do that, I want to ask you if you are a farmer, are you getting extra revenue out of every acre? Are you getting maximum revenue or are you getting diversified revenue? You could be if you would check out what's going on at Truterra. Truterra is focused on supporting farmers at every stage of the sustainability journey. It can help you plan, make, and maintain a regenerative generative management practice that you can then put into place and improve your agronomic and your economic sustainability. You know what? You can make money for doing things like cover crops, reduction of tillage, and all of a sudden you're already doing some of those things. Why not make a little bit of money? Go to truteraag.com, truteraag.com to learn more. Packing and processing was the one that brought this up. Todd, you're the most familiar with it of all of us. It, granted, there's only four of them. We hear all that. Four companies that control Tyson, Cargill, JBS, and whatever the other one is. Uh, but they're not making they're they're not making all the money. It seems like I, I own stock in Tyson. Tyson's uh, Tyson's in bad shape. I bought it. I bought stock in Tyson after they after their share value plummeted forty six percent. If they're making all this money, why did their share price price plunge by forty some percent? Well, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tough business, and a lot of these are tough businesses. I mean, you even look at the grocery business, and 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 that's a notoriously low profit margins, and so you have you know, really low profit margins at, at almost every phase of the supply chain. And, and and I think that is is part of what we're talking about here is that margins just keep continued to get driven down. And the cost of getting into the business of maintaining the the assets that are necessary to be competitive in the business keeps going up. And so, you know, uh, what I've said in the swine industry for a while is that we have a sustainability and economic sustainability problem because we have uh, high barriers to entry in the form of capital expenditures required to get into the business. We have low profit margins. And in the last 20 years or so, we've added a significant amount of volatility to that as well. And so to me, in order to make the industry sustainable, economically sustainable in the long term, we need to address at least one of those three factors. Ryan, I got a question for you. When you just said the free market would fix something, if it was, if the profits were so amazingly good, uh, there'd be a bunch more players hopping in there. The reality is it's hard to do. We hear this a lot and I don't, I, I'm not fatalistic. I'm not saying that I see a big change until the producers start to do like your buddy did. Okay, the example being, <laughs> these folks that we call middlemen obviously have vast amounts of capital deployed, and they also, it's a sophisticated and and very, at this point, uh, well-structured marketplace. So if you're going to supplant what we call middlemen, how do you see it happen? How would it happen? Direct to consumer, yes. It's still- And, and it's in- 
every situation is going to be different. Every person moving up one step in the value chain is going to be different. Um, one thing I think people, the, the first mistake I see people making is when they want to move up uh, one step further into the value chain, they feel like they have to go and take on Walmart or they feel like they have to go and take on the biggest of the big. Because that was the first question that so many people asked me when I'm doing this little pretend beef business that I've got is, well, well I'll, this is going to be great. Let's scale it. Like, I don't want to fucking scale it. I, <laughs> I don't want... I don't want that much work. I want to just, you know, help my friend out. I want to help my other friend. I want to help my friend out that's raising cattle. And I want to help my friends out here in the city that want to know where their, where their beef is coming from. I can provide that. Todd, Todd, does he, does he just define, he's really not putting up a lot of money, time or effort. All he did was connect his farmer buddies with his yuppie buddies. He is the middleman. Sounds I like am. a much better example of the middleman than it is. I mean, and I'm and I'm happy to announce that. But then it's just like, well, John, do you want to go and deal with Allie? No. You well, know, and, and uh, what's, what's and that's what's and so that's and that's what that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a pain in the ass premium on all of their parts. Well, and what, what's interesting about that is is when you when you get uh, direct to a uh, consumer business set up like that, and you decide you'd want to start scaling it you very quickly get to the point where you become what you were trying to replace because you, right. know, you try to get more efficient and you try to take some cost out. And the reality is, is that there is, I don't know of any direct to consumer meat business that's not, you know, significantly more expensive. Right. And it's just, right. it's always going to be that way because you just can't compete with the scale and, and the specialty of the of the of the supply of the modern supply chain and so you know to me if you're gonna if you're gonna replace a significant portion of the the for example the 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 meat supply in the u.s you're gonna need a lot of these businesses to do that because if you scale them up they're just going to become basically what we have today and that's that's the that's the term is scale that's the that's where it gets really hard and it's that's not the intention of what I'm wanting to do here. Incidentally, mm-hmm. and since Ryan's more corporate than you and I, Todd, I've decided. That's, that's if I, ever back, I mean, I if, feel oppressed when you say things like that. If I ever go back to a corporate job, I've decided I'm just going to spend a bunch of time on LinkedIn, then go and sit in the boardroom, and I'm just going to spout all the corporate buzzwords of the moment because scale and scalability has become the one of the last few years. And all you got to do is let the CEO talk and then say something like, can we scale this? And then you've got to then see a few other things out there about circle back. Um, we don't do outside the box anymore. Um, uh, and then stakeholder. You guys, if I can then say, well, it's important if we're not only going to scale this, that we look at where the stakeholder value is. And if I can just say words like that, then I think I'm going to get a promotion. Well, yeah. And then just drop those grenades in the in the boardroom and leave. And everybody will just talk about how brilliant you were and how you're not scared to ask the tough questions. Uh, is it scalable? What about our stakeholders? Let me circle back on that. Right. Anyway, real yeah. quickly. And then we'll just go- do what the American food system does. Just add a bunch of sugar to it, make it taste good to fat people, and then just uh, make a bunch of money. <laughs> so speaking Oh, that of seems to be the add. answer every time. But this thing came up, middleman versus value added. And by the way, I mean, none of us, obviously all three of us here are ag people. We want there to be everybody making money. The I guess the biggest thing was to correct this idea that there's a bunch of fat margins being made. Now, there have been the Tysons and the Cargills and using the meat processor. And the ADMs and the bungies on the grain handle generally have probably had, you know, years where they, they don't... Uh, they probably had less. I'm gonna, yeah, there. I've been on on the grain side of things, and since I do spend most of my day there, yeah, uh, it looks like a lot of money. But when you break it down into cents per bushel, it's not nearly as fat and happy. I mean, to make the money that these uh, large internationals are making, the amount of volume that they have to process through that is, it's unfathomable to people on farm. And so in the, and it's and so it might look like a lot of money, but everybody that's tried to enter into that space and tried to tech their way out of it or tried to step in in the middle of them typically does not last because those businesses are so damn efficient. 
Okay, and we'll throw another one. You you've oftentimes pointed out, Ryan, the difference between efficiency and optimization or efficiency right. and maximization. Let's right. just use this example. You just said there's very little sense per bushel. A B C D, Archer Daniels Mendel, Man, Archer's Daniel Midland, Bungie, Cargill, Dreyfus, the four big grain handlers. And the listener might be saying, well, they're still just middlemen because they don't have the ground and they don't have the inputs and they don't have the weather risk. They're just making that money. You know what risk they have? They have massive amounts of capital deployment risk. And, and and that's what a lot of people, I think, in ag would forget. They are out there in Illinois thinking, well, I'm the one that's worried about the weather. Well, you've got crop insurance. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, and the reality is you might have as many protect more protections on a per dollar invested at the farm level than you would if you're one of the big four grain handlers because their risk is largely capital. And I'm talking shit loads of capital, right, right? Oh. Well, just what happens, what happens, and sadly, we've seen this before, what happens when the person that's buying your crop just disappears? Yeah. You know, that that's happened in almost every market, and that's where the those companies with massive credit facilities, they ensure that the seller is good, and then they ensure that the buyer is good. And so, if you're trying to, and we're heavily dependent upon exports here, you know, if you want to go ahead and get in the export space, get ready to take your multi-million dollar lumps as far as having a buyer that you sail a vessel of soybean meal or soybeans to, just all of a sudden take those and, oops, check bounced, and then they're gone. I, and that, I mean, that about. happens. I want to talk about- well, yeah, uh, You mentioned the, the Cargills and the Bungies and the Dreyfus. You know, I mean, you look at those numbers and, and you know, we saw reports last year, I think, you know, Cargill had record, record profits and record, record sales. Um, I, I'd have to look it up to be sure, but I think their revenue was somewhere around $165 billion, which is a lot of money. And their profit was around $5 billion. I mean, that's a, what's that? That's like a 3% profit margin, you know, and that's, that's the way, you know, it has been for a long time. And, and I mean, if you just think about, you had to generate $165 billion in sales in order to make $5 billion. Uh, that's a, that's a ridiculous business. <laughs> you know, if you weren't already in that business, who in the world would you get into that it. business? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, if, if you weren't entrenched in it and had all of your tremendous amounts of capital deployed and such networking within it a new a new a new participant would probably not enter it because you'd say this is good so anyway now we're kind of pointing out and again the it's important because we all work in ag and the listeners to the business of agriculture aren't all just producers they're they're throughout let's take it the other way and this is why i think it's important to point out it's neat to go on social media and gripe that the middleman is making money and, and the producer is not but you guys said before we hit the record button take it the other direction we're talking about the stuff that the farm sells, whether it's blueberries or that log out of my woods. And I'm you know, generically saying it was a $400 log. Obviously, it depends on what it was. If it was an ash, the market was glutted because the damn Chinese killed all the ash, you know, with the Emerald Ash Board and whatever. There's this entire thing where we think about where the product from our farms goes. But you guys said, if you looked at it the other way, what about the stuff that the farm buys? You want to cut out those middlemen? Okay, you want to cut out the ag retailer? That's happening a little bit. You could call the ag retailer a middleman. Now, here's the thing. Everybody listening to this, my friends at Helena or Nutrien or Wilbur Ellis, they're all saying, what the hell are you talking about? You're calling us a middleman? It's the same idea because you're talking about someone between the manufacturer and the end user that is making money on the middle. So as much as we might say, I want to cut out the packers or I want to cut out the grain handlers because they're middlemen, well, look at the middlemen that you pay dear farmer. And I mean, you guys gave a couple examples. I just used ag retailer. How many more do you guys want to offer? I mean, but the ag retailer is a great example. If that ag retailer is doing more for you than just taking your order and, you know, processing your glyphosate order and there's actual, you know, it's worth it to do business with them. And you can pencil that out pretty quickly because you can go to a no service ag retailer and then when something goes wrong and that ag retailer isn't there for you, um, you know, is it worth it at that point, right? So there is those things, but ag retail is a great example. As soon as somebody steps out too far a line and, and collects way too much margin, that's 
a perfect entry point for some other competitor to come in there and knock out the market share and do something better. That's that's free market capitalism. And so those middlemen that are not adding value, and there's plenty of them in ag, and so those people that aren't doing that, be prepared to be competed with. And once the competition steps in there, better up your game or get out. So let that well, market just, work. I just went down work. the road of ag retail. Again, I, I was trying to make it so that we all think about this because the reality is there's usually not that great of margins. Your Cargill example is fantastic. Who in the hell would invest $165 billion to make, to make five? And then five the, sounds like a lot of mo- five billion sounds like a lot of money until you realize it takes 165 to get it. Yeah. And then the other part of it is now we're turning the tables and saying, okay, if you're at the production level and you're lamenting the idea that there are people between you and the customer that are middlemen making money, ag retail, I'm sorry, retailers, uh, you know, groceries, processors, meat packers, et cetera, truckers, you can try and vertically integrate yourself. That's very hard to do. You know, try and go and build a meat processing facility. It's done. People are doing it. It's hard to do. Uh, you know, create your own grain handling facility. Fight, you know, put in your own rail spur. <laughs> you know, very difficult to do. Going yeah, to negotiate with the railroad, see how much fun that is. Well, look at what our uh, some of our farm friends are doing very smartly. They're circumventing certain aspects of ag retail and capturing of selling, saving. They're capturing that value by saving some of that expenditure. But all of a sudden, does that mean you've got to have your own toolbars and anhydrous wagons? Because when you want to go around the ag retailer, that's one of the things that they have. They have the ability for you to go get your anhydrous wagons, your toolbars. They have also tremendous amount of capacity. Are you going to bring in seven train loads of dry fertilizer? Uh, that's how fertilizer companies like to deliver. So there are these things that are very illustrative of how difficult it is sometimes to break the middleman the middleman uh, marketplace. Well, and we've even seen it at scale in the swine industry, where you look at a couple of the big packing companies on the swine side are are, are farmer owned, right? That they got together and basically built or bought um, these packing plants, and I think they're discovering what uh, what everybody that was already in the meat business knew is it's a tough business with low margins, and um, you know it's 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 a slog out there, and so they've got to be. You know, just as competitive and, and, you know, really, if you look at the amount of effort and investment they're putting in to what you're getting back out of it, it's it's really arguable whether that's the case. And, and I, I think, you know, another issue that we need to discuss is, you know, Ryan's uh, formula for calculating value. There, there really is two different ways to improve that value using Ryan's formula. You can reduce the cost to produce whatever that product is, or you can increase the value perceived or real um, of that product. And we spend almost all of our time in agriculture, and Damien and I have talked about this in the past, we spend almost all of our time in agriculture, in production agriculture specifically, talking about how do we reduce cost? How do we you know, lower the, the cost of production in order to hopefully create more value? But there is a whole other side of that equation that we spend very little time talking about. I mean, grow, growing the growing the revenue, increasing the revenue, or even increasing, obviously, the margin on the top end of it. Sure. Uh, real quickly, we're talking about the the difficulty in getting around this. Uh, let's give some examples of where I think it's already happening. We just did, but where it might, where there might be more opportunity to increase revenue by increased margin, I shall I say. Before I do that, I want to tell you about my new sponsor, Redox Bionutrients, a family business with products for ag and turf that are increasingly applied to acres in the United States and internationally. 30 years of proven infield success, Redox is helping farmers shift from traditional fertilizers to highly efficient carbon-based technology. You've heard about the biological companies. A bunch of them have been around for like a year or three. Redox has been around for 30 years. You don't have products actually selling for 30 years if they suck. Go to Redox Bionutrients. I'm sorry, RedoxGrows.com. It's Redox Bionutrients providing superior nutrition, abiotic stress defense, root growth, soil health, and efficient nutrient uptake. You can find out more at RedoxGrows.com. Also, check out the Redox Grows podcast. I was on it. RedoxGrows.com. Okay. Retail, ag retail, I think, is getting squeezed because farmers of scale, there's that word again, Ryan, can probably circumvent certain aspects of traditional ag retail and then capture some of that value, if you will. Um, 
direct to consumer on beef specialty crops. I think it's very difficult to talk about going specialty uh, direct to consumer on corn <laughs> or soybeans or wheat or unless it's maybe oats for specialty about any of the commodities, canola, what have you. Um, processing. We're seeing a little bit of this where like Todd just talked about where maybe the a few farmers of scale get together, even of smaller farmers, and then say, it's kind of the old cooperative mindset. We're going to, you and me and seven of us are going to team up and do that. The marketplace is more open to this because of the internet, technology, stuff on our phone. But I, I guess my gut tells me, and I want to hear from both of you, it's got a maximum point where it's it's not, I, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to take it's going to hit a point where it can't go much bigger, more, more, more entrenched. Well, one of the one of the challenges about these uh, not middlemen that we've been talking about are that they are very exposed to labor in a lot of cases. So, if you look at production agriculture, um, it's certainly labor has been a challenge. I don't think you'll think it'd be hard pressed to find a farmer anywhere in the world that wouldn't tell you that labor has been a challenge, but. When you think about the amount of labor that is required to, yeah, to get back to use the meat example, to produce a, a steer or a hog compared to the amount of labor that it takes still to uh, process that meat, you have a much higher exposure to that uh, labor element. And so as we develop technologies that reduce our dependence on labor, I think eliminating or, you know, at least to some degree, some of those, uh, again, not middlemen, those value added steps might become more attractive. And so if we look at that both on the on the physical automation side in terms of robotics and things like that. And then, you know, obviously the hot topic lately has been artificial intelligence on the, on the cognitive task side. Uh, it, that may even the playing field a little bit and make that a little more attractive for uh, producers to maybe take a swipe at taking some of that value out of the middle. But I think it's important to note that the uh, big players are going to be uh, obviously adopting those technologies as well. And so they're going to continue to get uh, more effective. So I think there is a reasonable argument to be made that that might even the playing field a little bit with the technology. But again, everybody's going to have access to the same technology. And if anything, the, the bigger players are going to have uh, greater access to that technology because they have the resources to, to both uh, uh, acquire that technology and to optimize its use. Yeah, then... Um... Yeah, so to that point, I think once they start competing with the technologies, that's going to go ahead and provide an excess margin opportunity in the short term. But then once an, a competitive landscape takes over and they see that excess margin being made, then other players adapt to said technology and then it it becomes a commodity business again where it goes back to a very historical like average margin over the course of time like that's one thing i think that we see is there is and it's just like in lots of areas of ag where if you look at the history of ag all the way back to the beginning of time ag is an industry that is incredibly low margin for incredibly long periods of time with fits and starts of greatness you know and that's and when people see those fits and starts of greatness that's when they get frustrated but as things go in food production and production of things that we need versus want when there's excessive margins being taken out of the middle during those periods of greatness what ends up happening is somebody th somebody or something steps in the middle and then takes it back to the historical low margin re uh, reality which, which by the way you then if is that the goal to make it so that we all have no margins but it, it seems that that happens in particularly in agriculture. it's the history of food production it's, it, well, at least the recent, it's, it's the history in the last hundred years for sure. Modern agriculture. Oh no, <laughs> I was going to throw this out there. All throughout uh, history. Another thing, you know, when I'm in that boardroom and I throw out words like scalability and stakeholders, um, I'm also talk about low hanging fruit. The reality is, if you're in this business and you still are hearing, oh, you know, the middleman's making the money, the farmer's not making money, um, we've already we've already picked off some of the low hanging fruit. You know. Travel agents used to be, if you wanted to go somewhere, you about had no choice but to use a travel agent, right? 
And I still use a travel booker because my travel is a little more complex than, say, once a year planning a trip to Disney with the family. And mine's tremendously more complicated. So I pay her. It used to be the airlines paid this travel booker. I pay her because of the value added, meaning, hey, Joni, I've got to be in Sacramento, then Mankato, then wherever, wherever. And she handles all this. So there is still this thing, but the low-hanging fruit, when you think about it, we've got some direct-to-consumer already going on where you you know the, the stuff that's easy. We've got uh, certain channels that were more middleman, not value-added, that have been cut out. And I think that's going to happen to a point, but I don't think we ever get to where it's not still there because the functions still actually deliver value. So, Damien, can I uh, share a screen here? I don't know. Maybe you're going to have to be the. I don't, know, I don't know how to do that. Because <laughs> right. I've not embraced the technology of Zoom in the last decade of my career. Um, I just made you. I just made it so you can share. Go ahead. Okay. So nice what do you got here? Uh, by the way, do you agree that we we've already picked off some of this, but it didn't end up being tremendously more margin? If you have a direct to consumer uh, meat business, you're picking up some margin. You're doing some more work, as Ryan reported out. If you are buying direct from uh, a manufacturer on seed or crop inputs, you're 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 keep you're retaining some margin or not giving it away to a retailer. Aside from those two things, aren't the, aren't those the two places where the low hanging fruit has already been picked? Yeah, I think that's where a lot of it is, and I, I think it's also important to uh, to understand that the consumer is paying a lot more money for, especially in the direct to 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 consumer meat business. The consumer is paying a lot more money, and so what has really happened there is not that you've captured that value that was being soaked up by those middlemen. What you've really done is is increase the amount of revenue in order to compensate you for uh, your inefficiencies in the in that process um, and obviously the consumer is uh, perceiving at least or experiencing more enough value to pay that extra money and so you know like I've always said more more power to you if you can if you can do that um, you know but it becomes more and more challenging as that uh, market gets bigger and again as we get back to the to the scale there's there's not as many consumers that are willing to to pay that extra uh, revenue uh, for that uh, perceived value, and so then th that's where you you end up. You know, my argument has not been uh, in opposition to direct to consumer meat at all. I'm, in fact, I'm very supportive of it and do some of it myself. But my my argument has been it's hard to imagine a scenario where that becomes the the dominant business model in the industry, or right. even really more than you know, maybe at the top end, 15% or so, because there's just not enough five. consumers out yeah, that are willing to, you know, pay for that, even in even in rich uh, countries like ours. Yep. What so are we looking at, Ryan? For those, for those of you that are listening, Ryan now has the uh, screen up, and he's got internet versus travel agents, and he's going back from 1987 till it looks like it goes till about the year 2020, 2017. Yeah. Yeah, this is brought to us by Michael Kitsis. Um, but when you look at the blue line there, that's the total employment of the travel industry. And again, the internet was a massive disruptor to the travel agency industry in the late, late 90s, early, early 2000s. When you look though at the total output in 1987 versus today so this was in 2020 and so but i mean it's still the trend is still continued yeah, they, they've got total output they've got productivity one can assume that means miles of travel booked or flights booked or something revenue i, what, what I mean you, get, you can base it upon revenue and productivity but when you look at the travel agents the number of them was reduced significantly because many of the what i'll call order takers the people that didn't really do much for you Yep. Uh, as a travel agent, they were replaced just like they are. I mean, the the typewriter replaced the people that just, you know, did prints and whatever. Right? I mean, there's technology comes in and disrupts every industry. So this goes to show, though, that the travel agents that survived are doing far more with it, far less of them out there. And so they are the ones that are actually adding value to people like you, Damien, who need something more complex. And the travel industry has never been bigger, but the travel agency industry has never been smaller. Yep. 
And the same thing is going to happen in ag as well. The where, 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 okay, where's the, where's the next shift? Because we already talked about it. Much of the, many of these things, ain't nobody going to take over the role the Cargill fills for the the three percent margin that they want to work on. Go ahead, right. and make me the host again, please. Go over and circle around my blue square, and then it says, "Make me host again." Um, you know what I mean? Where, where's the next one? I just said the low hanging fruit was direct to consumer on any kind of specialty crop or meat. The low hanging fruit was circumventing some of the retail chain because if you're big enough, you can get the, uh, the stuff. Where's the next one? Where's the next shoe that's going to fall, Todd? Well, yeah, I think I think there is uh, probably going to continue to be a movement of uh, producers getting together and leveraging technology to try to capture some of that value. And so you're seeing, oh, we've been talking about the direct-to-consumer meat business a lot, just because I think it's a, a good example. But there are some uh, uh, tools out there that are emerging that are more like uh, cooperative technology-enabled cooperatives, where we at least help you know with part of that marketing you know and that's always been a big part of the challenges is you know farmers don't grow up and and learn how to be good marketers right and so if they can provide some technology to say hey you know we'll help walk you through this give you you know and, and take some of that expertise uh, out of it uh, you know and 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 do that in an efficient way through uh, a technology enabled um, uh, solutions there, then I, I think we're, we're probably going to see more of that in terms of, you know, how you capture whatever that potential value is there. I think that's going to be a big uh, part of that solution. So you're basically taking, uh, you're, you're, you're simplifying some of those processes enough that you can be reasonably competitive with, with bigger, more sophisticated uh, competitors. Right, you guys think I've got one that I uh, I'm going to throw out here, but I, I want to make yeah, sure I, I don't trample on you. I I think you 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 will start to see next generation co-ops. That's what our grandpa started back in the 70s and 80s with the co-op system the way that it is, and now as the co-op system has grown up, you know now they start to look a lot more like the region. They, they look more like regionals, which now look more like the ADMs, monkeys, and Cargills that they you know, tried to re replace. I think there is a generation of people that do come together and they, the, the, the smartest business people in a community will get together and function in such a way that will look like a co-op. But then once they get to the scale, back to Todd's point here, 25, 30 minutes ago, they will likely over the course of 10, 15, 20 years, Turn into the businesses that they uh, that they tried to they replace. Set to replace because so the, the, because the, how they else do, into, how else they do you turn make into it work what they set out to replace? And then right. here's the one thing I want to throw at you, and this is where it all comes together. I thought it was a great thing that and Todd inspired it with his LinkedIn thing about calling these people middlemen presumes and, and you know that they add nothing of value, and that's where this whole thing came about. And we all agree that there have been some of those instances, but in general. Now, Todd, before we hit record, talked about there used to be you know, pig jockeys that grabbed up some feeder pigs from here, there, and there, and they didn't actually even go and load them. They just were on a phone jockeying them and trying to make some money in the middle. That's largely gone away because all of a sudden I've got my phone or I have a contract as a vertically right. integrated uh, uh, contract grower. The, what, what, what got rid of the pig jockey, Todd? It was information, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, and in the and there were fewer you were fewer players that were that were in that space, right? And so you you have uh, fewer people that need to communicate with each other and better tools for facilitating that communication. And, yeah, and there's, not there's not a hundred thousand. There. There's not a hundred thousand farmers that are feeding out uh, pigs on a small scale. There's five thousand that are doing it on a large scale, and then they've got the internet and the infrastructure in place, informationally infrastructure, information infrastructure to make it so that the pig jock becomes obsolete because he 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 can't he can't just jockey stuff around because now the marketplace knows. Well, you know, before he needed to know you know, 200 people, he needed to have a relationship, 200 people or 300 people, you know, in order to, to, to generate a business. And then that became fewer and fewer to the point where, you know, everybody that he needed to know already knew each other and they just could direct to each other. But, you know, I mean, I do a lot of work in developing markets as well. And you go over to Africa and parts of Southeast Asia and that, that pig jockey, you know, business um, is still very much in play because there's enough players and there's a, you know, lack of that, 
uh, technology. So it's, 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 yeah, it's technology in terms of ease of communication, you know, forums where people, buyers and sellers can get together. Uh, but it's also just the sheer number of producers. When you've got a bunch of small producers, you, you have to, you have to have a lot of relationships in order to, uh, to make that, you know, grease the wheels enough to make that work. Ryan, if you, you know think, that, if you think that person, Ryan, you, you have so a swear word. word. Ryan, you you came on. You're wearing your vest like you always do. You're using swear words. Nobody's going to complain about you. But you know what? I will get a complaint because somebody's going to say we prefer the term swine broker, not pig <laughs> jockey. I'm going to get complaints about Todd. Well, see, that's the good thing. See, Damien, you're serving a value add because I don't have to listen to those complaints because they're going to reach out to you and not me. So <laughs> I'm going to give them your email. You're the right, fucker. One at you, but uh, Ryan's got something to wrap up here. No, if you think that person's job is so easy, then replace them. Then you might find out that, oh, maybe it's not worth it for me to do this because my time, effort, energy, and resources are best spent right here doing what I do. Well, that's, and that's really the story of of modern agriculture is really that we've right. specialized and we've talked about this on the the business of ag success group. You know that that comes with some downsides for sure, right. and one of those downsides right. is that we don't know as much about the other corners of of our own industry, much less um, you know other industries that are dealing with similar issues. And so, and we we certainly, uh, I think, all three of us would be advocates for you know kind of re-expanding our knowledge to some degree, but but I don't think anybody wants to give away the advantages that we've gained by specializing and that we've just gotten really, really good at our our little segment. And you know, that again, that comes with downsides uh, downsides. One of those downsides is a lack of resiliency that we had a lot of discussion about during the the COVID nineteen pan- pandemic. But the advantages are so massive that you know it's really impossible just to completely ignore that so i think we're gonna have to find a way to to address some of those downsides and and within the within the existing system because i don't think that specialization uh system is going to go away because the benefits are just so incredibly massive the benefits are mostly the consumer i mean that's that's the you know the and so i hear the the farm person i hear saying well it doesn't benefit me well it kind of does you're a consumer too you know I mean, Walmart, Walmart has tremendous distribution and really affordable goods. Uh, you say, well, that didn't benefit me. Oh. Are you a consumer? Uh, and yes, at the end of the day, we all are consumers. Can I go? If you're so upset about it and you think that uh, you're a producer and Tyson's screwing you over, then go buy Tyson stock. Well, I don't want to buy Tyson stock because then that takes cash and then I then I don't have money to buy land. So I, never mind. I bought Tyson stock when they got hammered, and I'm up from I bought them at the very uh, bottom a dollar off of their bottom, and uh, they they need to uh, they keep on chugging. But I want to throw this out there. Here's the kind of another reality. We've already replaced middlemen who were adding a value in something you've done every day. If I go over here to the Kroger. Or just this weekend when I was replacing my water heater, I went to Home Depot and I went through and to buy my water heater and everything else, I scanned my own stuff. I scanned my own stuff at Home Depot and then swiped my credit card and went out to my car. We replaced a middleman that used to be called a cashier. And you're saying, well, that's not the same thing. It kind of is the same thing because look at the people that were instrumental between all the transactions that you do whether it's buying or selling, you know, the ag retailer or the meat processor, whatever it should be, buying or selling. Technology allowed us to do that. You say, oh, well, that's great. You saved a bunch of money. I'm not sure that I did because Lowe's also makes you do self-checkout. And then Kroger's competitors also make you do self-checkout. So it's not as though Kroger said, you're going to self-checkout, but everything's going to be 5% cheaper because you were at to... I'm not sure that happens because to your bigger point here, guys, it became the marketplace. The marketplace replaced the middleman, and it ended up being that the margins probably stayed about the same. Home Depot doesn't have higher margins just because they got rid of the cashiers. Am I right? I mean, the evidence would, would show that that's, the, that that's the case and that, that the technology gets implemented not when it becomes available, but when it comes when it becomes practical. And as the cost um, and the difficulty of hiring and recruiting and retaining people has gone up, especially over the last few years, you've seen an explosion in the number of automated, automated cashiers. And so that, that value, uh, that value calculation that we, that Ryan talked about at the very beginning 
changes and all of a sudden it makes a lot more sense to have a machine do that work than it does to have a person do that work and so you know i, I think that the important point is is what ron alluded to earlier as well is that this technology historically has always created more solutions more opportunities than it has created problems right and so it's always created more jobs actually um now the people that argue that this type of technology that we're implementing now is fundamentally different and that's no longer going to be true and i think there's a compelling pace case to be made for that but i think every other technology that we might use as an example people said the same thing this is fundamentally different whether you're talking about the cotton gin or the printing press or whatever it was everyone you know every every time you know we we said this is going to be you know a disaster and every time it has created more jobs and more opportunities for people than than it displaced now that can create a difficult transition and often does create a difficult transition but in the end it's always historically technology has always created more opportunities than it has destroyed and i guess we'll have to wait and see if this time is fundamentally 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 different uh but uh, history would tell you that the smart money is that it's not fundamentally different and that that what we're going to see here is an explosion of capability and an explosion and opportunities and certainly different types of jobs and different types of opportunities but more opportunities would be the the I think where the smart money is on this technology. Ryan's shaking his head. By the way, Ryan, I'm going to go on a limb and say there's no such thing as fundamentally different. <laughs> Not when it comes to some technological change in the marketplace that then fundamentally change, transforms the marketplace. Because you know what, uh, Warren Buffett got told during the whole dot com craze that he didn't know anything anymore because he kept going back to fundamentals and he said, there's no way this makes sense. The point is they tried to pretend that the fundamentals had changed and he and he said no. Well, the math will either work or it won't. Yeah. I want to throw you uh, I want to throw you another idea out here. If you think that also, if you're in the business of agriculture and you think, oh, I'm not sure I agree with all this. Well, all right, I'll just throw you another one. Sometimes middlemen got replaced and you didn't even really think about it. Let's say you grow corn and you're in Huntington, Indiana, where my farm is. You don't have three options within 30 miles to avoid the middleman and take your corn and sell it right directly to one of the ethanol processing producers that's there. Those did not exist 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there was no ethanol processing plant that you you had to go to the grain terminal. You had to go to the elevator. We've just middlemaned out the elevator with that. You know what? The elevator's still there. So you still have the elevator and this. So it's kind of the big point here of we didn't, where the value come? Well, somebody's bringing the value because they both still exist. I think we'll leave it right there. His name is Ryan Moe with StoneX. If you want to follow him, he's got smart stuff. He's on LinkedIn. They, you want to, I'm not going to give your email because they'll come and you know yell at you. So how do they want to find you? want to find you, Ryan. Yeah, email's fine. Uh, Ryan.mo at StoneX.com. We do our... Uh, Fun little midday thoughts that come out each day, right about noon central. So yeah. if they want to subscribe to that, just jump on, shoot me a note. We'll get it. Uh, we'll get them added. Just subscribe to his midday thoughts, his marketplace stuff. Uh, our other, other buddy Todd Thurman. Todd Thurman is uh, uh, what's the company now? Swine Insights. SwineInsights.com, or you can go to ToddThurman.me and learn way more about me than you ever probably wanted to know. And and both of them are on LinkedIn. They're both smart. They also both uh, do speaking. So if you've got a meeting coming up in 2024 and you want to hear more of this kind of stuff, uh, and maybe you've already heard enough from me, look up one of these two guys. I give my full endorsement of both of them. Uh, if you want to join the Business of Agriculture Success Group for just $99 a month, we get together every other week on Fridays, and these guys are on there with me and about uh, two dozen other people uh, talking about issues impacting agriculture. Thanks for being here, Ryan and Todd. Till next time, I'm Damian Mason, and this is the Business of Agriculture. Hey, thanks for being here. This episode of the Business of Agriculture was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You've heard me talk about Pattern Ag because I think it's a pretty cool concept. New technology that allows you to predict the problems you're going to have and therefore treat them before those problems cost you money. What kind of problems am I talking about? Pests 
and disease. Things like cord and root worm, uh, sudden death syndrome, cyst nematode, and a whole bunch of other bad things that happen out there in the field that can cost you money. Guess what? Pattern Ag will let you find out ahead of time if the disease or the pest pressure is there and therefore you're treating it before it costs you any money. What a great concept. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to learn more about their product, their technology, how it can make you money, save you yield, and all also, where you can find a rep that can come out there and do the work for you. Pattern.ag. 